Awesome, thanks for the kind introduction, Holly. And yeah, I'm Dr. Dane Happeny. I'm a physical therapist here in Corvallis, Oregon, uh, and coming up on 10 years practicing now out of school, which was pretty cool. And Holly, I will be terrible at picking up any questions out of the chat, so you can just interrupt me uh, as any questions come up. And please ask questions as we go. Uh, you can certainly save it for the end, but I'm fine. Uh, having questions at the time when the context is there and it makes sense. Um, so that would be A-OK -okay by me. Uh, so ultimately today's presentation, I'm gonna go ahead and screen share for the majority of it. Uh, so I'm gonna go there and then share and someone please speak up if you can't see what's on my screen. Uh, so this is our website uh, and everything in today's presentation is going to be in the patient center and then you go down to blog and then we have our blog linked up at the top so rather than doing like a pre powerpoint presentation um, i just made this blog and i'm going to use it as my powerpoint presentation and the goal is that it's a resource that will always be there on our website and it interlinks to a lot of our other blogs that i'm going to reference uh, in the talk uh, so ultimately, uh, when it comes to caregivers, uh, that definitely can be one of the most rewarding and challenging roles any of us will ever embrace. Uh, some of us choose it as our vocation and career, and others of us choose to caregive for a loved one or family friend or someone we care about. Uh, sometimes it chooses us, if you will. Uh, if you ever had a kid, you certainly qualify as a caregiver too. Uh, so know that as a caregiver, your selflessness is like what we're called to do as humans. Uh, whether you're a Christian or not, if you know the story of Jesus of Nazareth, it's one of sacrificing yourself to serve and save others. Uh, ultimately, you're, he, he mentioned that you should love your neighbors yourself and no other commandments greater than that. And so as humans, I think we would all agree loving others as we would love ourselves is very noble and caregiving is, is certainly part of it. And notice there that it did not say love your neighbor greater than yourself. Um, so I think that's gonna be a big reference point um, on this is uh, ultimately, like regardless of the nature of your caregiving, it can be hard to find the balance of feeling like you're caring well enough for those you're caring for and taking care of yourself. Uh, in general, all you need to do uh, to get a great starting point of uh, this advice is you just go on a flight and they're going to tell you in the unlikely event of loss of cabin air pressure during the flight, please put on your own oxygen mask before assisting those around you. Um, and we just know that we have to take care of ourselves before we can give 100% of ourselves to other. Uh, the other analogy would be uh, a lifeguard. Like you're not gonna be a very effective lifeguard if you don't know how to swim. Um, and so you gotta learn how to swim first. You gotta learn to care give for your, take care of yourself first before you can pour yourself out into others. Um, so with that, uh, the best way to do that, I think as the physical therapist, you would assume that I'm gonna talk to you about like posture around a bedside and with transfers and gait training and using an assistive device. And those are all important things and we will get there. Um, but ultimately I think we have to zoom out and consider our six pillars of health, which really make us tick. Uh, so within the caregiver blog, I linked the six pillars of health blog. And uh, so within that, it references our six pillars of health. Um, and so there was a physician, um, Dr. Rangan Chatterjee, he came up with what he called the four pillar plan. Uh, and so he had four pillars of health. Um, I really felt like as I read through it that, um, and honestly, I kind of thought of these six pillars actually like on my own. Uh, from just research and my experience through my doctorate program and treating people in clinic. And sometimes like, man, I am nailing like the manual therapy to help them feel better and the exercises and they're not getting better, like what gives? And so I zoomed out and was like, well, what makes for health, right? Uh, and this is kind of what I came up with. And then as I was researching, I came across the four pillar plan. Um, the four pillar plan, in my opinion, kind of just involves the mind and the body, but in my opinion, it's lacking the soul. Uh, and I really feel like, I mean, you've heard that all the time, right? Like mind, body, soul. Um, and so I added two pillars that I think are important and really like the top pillars. Um, and what's interesting as far as 
um, discussing this within the nature of hospice or palliative care is these pillars are very highlighted at the end of life, right? Um, both for uh, the person who is at end of life as well as those caregiving for them, right? Um, so with that, the first pillar would be spirituality, faith, mindfulness, like that reason for being, right? Obviously at the end of life, you're considering a lot of like, man, like how was my life? Like, you know, was it worth living? All of that. So whatever that means to someone, whether that is a religion or faith or agnostic or whatever it may be, um, if we aren't confident in that and of ourselves, usually life is pretty hard. We've got a lot of questions. Um, so that would go for yourself as well, is being grounded in your spirituality or your faith or your mindfulness and being confident in that. And then of course, being able to meet other people where they're at and respectful of their background and beliefs and, and whatnot, um, but that you can meet and support them in, in their spirituality. But first, you gotta take care of yourself. Uh, Number two is relationships. And I guess I'll scroll down here. This is all in word format. Uh, and then I do have four other, well, three other experts right now that are giving me a more like a nice five minute blog on all these and they can speak to the importance of them better than I can as a PT. Um, uh, so far I have that for nutrition. So there's uh, like a five minute read on the importance of nutrition. And of course I've written the one on exercise and activity. Uh, so it does go in, in the near future. Uh, their due dates were like September 2022, but I keep hounding them and I'll have I'll have more information in the future on, on these as well. So that's lower. Um, so number two would be relationships, right? Which of course is, is very important um, for those that you're caregiving for, right? I mean, we see the whole gamut from a very supportive family um, to no family or friends, right? Um, and, and to family or friends, but there's some broken relationships or some tensions, right? Um, and so uh, very important that you yourself are aware of your own relationships and you have your own support system. Uh, we've all had that like long, hard day where we've gone through some hard stuff. Um, it's important, of course, keeping HIPAA in mind. Um, to be able to vent and kind of, uh, you know, debrief and offload uh, some of the hard things that we have to see and experience uh, to other people. And so if your own relationships are, have tension, um, it's going to be hard to help facilitate someone else to pour into their relationships, especially at end of life. And again, it's just going to be hard for you to give 100% of what you've got. Um, then sleep. Um, sleep is very important. Uh, I kind of ordered these, it's, it's funny, we actually, I was just having a discussion with one of my PTs today. She had uh, kind of a, tried to squeeze a long weekend into a short period of time. Uh, flight was delayed, got back late, um, you know, has had less sleep than normal and is now two days removed from that, but was like, man, like I'm feeling it today, right? And so she's given 100% of what she's got for her patients right now, but it is challenging for her. Uh, and I'm always going philosophical on, on stuff, right? And I was like, man, isn't that fascinating that like how sleep is, right? Like if you just had exercised poorly on Sunday and Monday, but like exercise well today, like you'd probably be feeling a lot better than your lack of sleep. Like it's hard to get sleep back until you get a few days through, right? Um, so with that, like we can't go sleepless for much more than 48, 72 hours, I mean, I know we can, but it's not ideal. And you can just appreciate compared to exercising, how terrible you would feel if you've gone 72 hours without sleep compared to 72 hours without exercise, right? Um, so sleep's important. All of us are different um, as far as, you know, six and a half hours, seven hours. So general average recommendations, like seven and a half to eight hours of sleep um, in general but all of us are a little different. So ultimately some keys are that you should feel well rested um, and you should start to get appropriately tired um, towards the end of your day. And it is very normal to have that like somewhere between two to 6 p.m. like hour, like little sluggish that you kind of push through. Um, that's your body starting to rev down, but you kind of get that second wind and then you're getting tired when you would normally go to bed. Um, in general, trying to be have a consistent study. So um, I was just listening to a sleep expert the other day. I haven't validated this research, but literally some of the like regeneration of hormones and all of that happens within like two hours of when you went to sleep the previous night. So if you go to sleep at nine o'clock, you know, one night, 
but 11.30 the next night, even if you got eight hours of sleep, like you slept until 9.30, you're actually gonna miss out on some of the effects of the sleep because of your irregularity. So regularity is very important. And there's a ton of other research. This is not a sleep presentation, so I won't go into any further detail, but sleep is important. Um, and then stress management. Um, I notice it's not no stress, it's stress management, right? So all of these have a bell curve, right? Like there's too little, and then there's too much, and we're looking for like the Goldilocks just right, right? Like if you're sleeping 10 hours a day, like usually that's actually a sign or symptom of depression, right? You, usually, it doesn't have to be, maybe that's your, your go-to. Um, and obviously if you're sleeping too little, that's a problem. Same with stress, you want the right amount of stress. Uh, I reframed my, uh, you know, those little butterflies coming into the meeting as that my body was preparing me to be on top and really be able to access my brain and be ready to present to all of you and be on my best effort as opposed to like, oh man, I'm so nervous, I don't know. Um, my anxiousness could have been too much uh, where I can't, couldn't even find the words to say or was sweating or, or whatever, maybe not that some of that's not going on, but again, there's like that right amount of stress. Um, so enough to keep you motivated and on task but not too much that you're overwhelmed. Um, and I think that's pretty easy to know if you're overwhelmed or if you're bored, um, we're shooting for the middle. Um, and then nutrition. Nutrition's important. Um, we simplify it uh, to eat protein, veggies, healthy fats, and intentionally enjoy complex carbs and occasionally sugar. Um, that's nice and well balanced. For the most part, that's gonna help you regulate your blood pressure well, get the nutrients you need, um, and have it be sustainable because like you can say yes to the donut that your coworker brings or like the little extra flavor in your coffee um, or the birthday cake, right? So you can do some of those things that make relationships feel very natural and uh, it's just a good balance and it's sustainable as opposed to avoiding those things and then, you know, going over the deep end and overdoing those things because you're like, well, tomorrow I'm starting again. I'm not gonna do any of this. So that sustainability is huge. Um, and then lastly, exercise and activity. Um, and um, that, uh, before I go there, what I want to acknowledge um, is that when we talk about balance, right? Like that's, that's kind of one of those, uh, maybe prior to COVID and uh, pivot, uh, balance was like a, a key word that a lot of people would use and, and tie onto. And I think what's important to recognize on balance is I really think of the scales and like, when you just barely remove something off one scale, you kind of get this over dropping, but it ends up like leveling out or when you add something. Um, and really in my own personal life, I've just learned that balance is like on average, like when I zoom out over the course of the week and the month and the year and multiple years, that on average I've been pretty balanced. Um, you can look at this, um, like kind of these six pillars, right? And I'll give you an example from my own personal life. We tried to get our three kids, and actually, I guess I have to update my bio, we got a fourth on the way, due May 30th. So we try to get our kids, that's, it could be another discussion about balance, going for kids. Uh, we try to get our kids in bed at eight o'clock, right? Um, rarely does that actually happen, but sometimes it does, right? Um, and then we have restructured things where they're helping us more on prepping for the next day and doing the dishes and all that kind of stuff, but we have seasons where we're not as great at that. So sometimes we get them in bed at 8.30 and then, uh, you know, then we gotta do the dishes, right? And then I didn't quite finish my charting for the day, so I gotta do my charting to make sure that I'm done with that. And then it's 9.30 and my wife and I haven't really like talked at all, right? And so then I have a decision to make of my workout time's at 5.30 in the morning, so do I go to bed right now and not really pour into my relationship at all um, and give myself enough sleep to wake out for my workout? Uh, or um, do we hang out right now and I sleep in, right? Um, and right there, I kind of, I almost sometimes have to sacrifice like two things. Like I'm either sacrificing, well, I guess one thing sometimes. I can sacrifice my relationship, get my sleep and my stress, or sleep and my exercise, right? Or I can do the relationship and still get the sleep and sleep in, but then I miss my exercise. And so you kind of get the point how they fight each other a little bit, right? Um, and then you could also factor in how I manage stress. Like 
I manage stress both by talking with my loved ones um, and spending time with them. And I also manage it with exercise and activity. And I also manage it with sleep. Um, and so you can see how they're very interconnected. Um, and so specifically on the exercise, since that's kind of like my, you know, expertise, um, a lot of us on that exercise, the common excuse is time, right? Uh, is I don't have enough time because I'm pouring into my relationships and I want to get enough sleep. Um, and so it's, it's hard to find that balance. Um, so one thing that I would encourage you all is you can get a really good workout in, in like, six minutes um, and uh, I might show you how in a second um, and so you can get a really good workout in in six minutes um, and oftentimes we think oh I need to do this formal routine and take 30 minutes and I don't have that time right um, and so uh, one of the other blogs that I reference in the self tips um, is this uh, life hack just get a little bit better every day and so you can reference that, um, but basically it shows like the exponential, this is from James Clear's Atomic Habits, um, like the exponential improvement of getting 1% better every day. Um, and it's actually greater than getting 1% worse every day, which is pretty cool. Um, and then uh, you can see, I'll well, see anything else. Um, I mean, in general, we're gonna have some ups and downs along the way, so we all view that like we're gonna improve in life and our six pillars, like you'll leave this like, I'm gonna improve, and you view this beautiful graph of a straight line, and usually we have ups and downs because life happens and those balanced things happen. Uh, but ultimately, for anyone who likes math out there, 1% um, of 24 hours comes out to 14.7 minutes, or I think that's like 14 minutes, 37 seconds, or something like that. So let's just round up to 15. So uh, with these six pillars of health, one thing I've challenged myself to do on this new year is if I get to the end of the day and I wasn't very balanced, picking one of those pillars I've been struggling at, struggling at and devoting 15 minutes to it. Um, 15 minutes won't chip too much into your sleep, although sometimes you can choose to go to sleep 15 minutes early uh, or sleep in 15 minutes. Um, but it can have a profound impact on getting 1% better, right? So you could either call your mom, right? Or your friend or have a conversation. Um, you could read a book uh, that helps you manage stress or learn, right? Um, you could get a 15 minute workout in. Um, you could spend 15 minutes and try to uh, plan a grocery list uh, to better meal plan for the week. Um, you could do 15 minutes of the Calm app and try to meditate and kind of like bring down your stress. Um, you, so those are all the things that just like 15 minutes you can commit. Um, and that can have a profound impact. Um, so uh, yes, on exercise and activity, the literature is pretty clear that ideally you would get 150 minutes a week. So 30 minutes, five days a week of moderate exercise in, which is just a brisk walk, which is nice. Uh, to really like it clears this threshold of risk for cardiovascular disease, uh, heart attacks, respiratory issues, type 2 diabetes complications, all of that. Um, but even the 15 minutes is going to get you there. If you did 15 minutes of exercise, uh, that would get you 45, you know, like 75 minutes out of the week if you did it five days. Um, that's halfway there, um, and that has profound improvement. And so the analogy I'll use sometimes is uh, if your CPA uh, recommended that you should save 15% into your retirement uh, of your income and you're like there's no way I can do 15% so what do we do we save 0% right um, if we saved even 5% for 30 years like you're probably gonna be a millionaire maybe um, depending on where you're at income wise right um, but it just goes to show that even when you can't hit the recommended amount of the sleep and the nutrition and the exercise that you do get compound interest on that 1% better every day. Um, so I think we tend to be an all or none society, right? Like I need to do it how I saw on Instagram or read in that article or nothing. And usually if you just do a little bit, it can have a profound impact on your life. And what's hard is that we want the magic pill where we feel better right away. Um, and that usually doesn't exist. And what the magic pill is, is consistency over years and years and years. Um, so all that being said to kind of balance. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, I'm gonna pause for a second and ask if there's any questions first. 
Um, does anyone have any questions? Yet, but okay. um, then give it give a minute for anybody to yeah pop something maybe I'll inspire you in the next minute if we don't have a question we're gonna do a six minute every minute on the minute workout so <laughs> optional of course but I think I'd like you to feel what you can do in six minutes are the uh, I have a question are mm -hmm. the six pillars in any specific order yeah so I I prioritize them based on my evidence-based practice of what I feel like is most important. And evidence-based practice, by definition, is a third, what does the literature say? A third, what is uh, your experience as a clinician? And then a third, when you're interacting with a patient, what is that patient's values? So in this case, I guess I'll use my own values, but I, I really have extrapolated the values from working with thousands, tens of thousands of people um, over 10 years um, and again just having that trial of error right like hey you're doing better what are you doing oh like it was actually you getting a therapist and working through some of that stuff that helped like oh you actually started sleeping better oh you changed your diet and you're eating less inflammatory food um, like oh you got a super deep tissue massage um, like oh it was actually maybe me a little bit but you also doing your stuff right and so it's it's really been that balance but it really has seemed to be like um, if someone is like just lost a loved one, right, or someone close to them, um, we can all appreciate that exercise in that moment probably isn't gonna be terribly helpful, right? Um, what is helpful is, again, your leaning into like your reason for life and living and purpose and talking to others about it and probably getting a good night's sleep, right? And all that will help you manage your stress. And so, I feel like all four of those, like that's the time where it's okay um, to do DoorDash three times, uh, three times a week or fast, right? Some of us lose our appetite. Um, and I would say that has less effect as well as the exercise than having that reason for being, having those relationships, getting your sleep. Um, so I, I did order them in order of importance um, and kind of how long you can go without those things being bad before life is hard. So, good question. But I do, I do view it as a circle and overlapping Venn diagram. So yes, I put it linear, but they are all very important. Any other questions? All right, okay. So, we're gonna do a six minute, every minute on the minute. Um, in the blog, actually, I linked this time-based workouts. Um, and it has an every minute on the minute, which basically means you do an exercise every minute. Um, it has what is called a, uh, a quap, which is as quickly as possible. So you just say, hey, I'm gonna do these exercises this many times as quick as I can. That definitely gets your heart rate going. Uh, and then there's an AMRAP, which is as many rounds as possible, which is basically like, hey, I'm going to um, try to, I'm gonna do these three exercises, this many sets. I'm gonna try to do it as many times as I can in six minutes. Um, and so, uh, like, there's really no excuse to do not do an AMRAP during your day because literally you can pick the time. I mean, you can do an AMRAP for one minute, right? Um, that won't be as hard. But even a six-minute AMRAP, like, literally your only resting is you need, like, that's going to get some cardiovascular effect and, again, can have, like, exponential impacts on your day compared to zero minutes of getting your heart rate up other than maybe, you know, being stressed. Um, so, uh, and then a Tabata is uh, a style of workout where you do eight rounds of 30 seconds. So it ends up being four minutes, right? Usually people link some Tabatas together, but basically you work for 20 seconds and then um, you rest for 10 seconds. Um, so that's a, a nice style. Um, and actually, you know what? I was gonna do an every minute on the minute, but I think I'm gonna swap and we're gonna go with the Tabata because that's only gonna take four minutes, which is like pretty sweet, but it's gonna probably have slightly less rest. Um, so, come yeah, let's hear it. Uh, someone who wants to avoid the exercising, I like yeah. it, let's hear it. <laughs> let's get the question in. Um, uh, it's a question about sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're talking about sleep, does the sleep have to be continuous to achieve the rest? Mm. There's a lot of situations with caregiving where you may need to wake up yourself up to yes. like, turn the patient or 
So first and foremost, I will qualify. I am not a sleep expert. So that is, uh, it's out of my scope to give you like the scientific answer on that. Uh, what I can provide you is my evidence-based practice based on it, which is what I know to be true from the literature. And to be fair, uh, most of my literature would be level five evidence, which is expert opinion, because I've learned most of my stuff on sleep through podcasts and that kind of stuff that I've listened. They are often referencing level one evidence of systematic reviews and meta-analysis, um, but I am kind of taking their word for it and not vetting for it. So um, yes, interrupting your sleep is not ideal. Um, because it is going to interrupt your deep sleep um, as well as your REM sleep um, and that is going to affect that cycle and that is where some recovery and healing occurs. Um, so yes, it's, it's not ideal, um, but um, you know, still trying to get the sum of sleep is definitely going to be your best bet and sometimes that does look like a two hour nap when you're no longer caregiving for that individual. So. Um, so yes, it's not ideal, and that probably should have been something that I should have referenced up front as recognizing that a lot of people working through night shifts with people like 12 hour shifts, right? Or maybe even your own 24 hours, right? Um, that can be hard, and it can be then hard to have your consistency, right? Um, so it's not ideal, but I think a good chunk of the battle is recognizing that and knowing that you still have five other pillars of health that you can tweak and refine to like still try to improve, have a well-rounded health as best as possible, even though your sleep pillar isn't ideal. So, um, and man, if anyone has a sleep expert, they can send my way. I've reached out to like every sleep expert in the Valley and everybody just ghosts me on responding to an email to write our, our, our sleep pillar blog. So if you know of someone, please email me after. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. There's plenty of time for questions afterwards. So we're gonna do a Tabata um, where you'll be able to see in like basically four minutes how you can get a sweat going and get some muscle working. Um, so there's actually, there's a dime a dozen uh, like apps out there and there's also this app called a stopwatch that works great. Um, but uh, it's kind of hard to see on the screen here, but there's smart wad timer, wad being workout of the day. It's in Google Play Store, Apple iStore. Store. So you hit that, you got the smart wad timer. I'm not sure if it's backwards on your screen like it is on mine. And then if you go out of it, um, right now it's on an every minute on the minute for 10 minutes. So I had a patient do that yesterday. Um, so if you go back to it on the home screen, um, it has the various time-based workouts. So it's probably hard to read there, but there's an AMRAP. There's a four time, which would be in as quickly as possible. It just runs the timer. There's an EMOM and then there's a Tabata. So lucky us. So we're gonna click on the Tabata. Um, I might mess this up because it has rounds. The traditional Tabata is like eight minutes, but I'm gonna shoot for eight rounds because I think that might be eight rounds of 30 seconds. Um, oh, it lets me customize the work range. So we're going traditional Tabata. So we're gonna work for 20 seconds and then we're gonna rest for 10 seconds and we're gonna do eight rounds. And then uh, we are actually gonna keep it super simple. We're gonna do squats and we're gonna do an isometric march, um, which I'll show you. And I would love for everybody to participate. If they're able, obviously you don't have to, if you don't want to. Um, so what we're gonna do, I'm gonna try to get the screen here, cool. Um, so we're going to squat for 20 seconds straight, okay? Uh, please stay short of any pain. Uh, don't push into anything that hurts you. Um, a substitute for a squat um, could be a hip hinge, so you're going to bend your knees less. Um, and what a hip hinge would look like is slight knee bend, hip hinge, back up squeezing your glutes. Okay, so that would be a modification if your knees hurt. Uh, if your back hurts, hopefully the squats feel okay. <laughs> um, and then uh, you could always do some heel raises. And then the other one we're going to do is an isometric march. So the isometric march. You're gonna, uh, for a five second hold, you're gonna try to march your knee as high as you can the whole time you're trying to get your top foot as far away from your bottom foot as possible. And then you're gonna switch, try to hold that for about five seconds. Um, and basically you're gonna go for 20 seconds, it's gonna beep, we're gonna rest for 10 seconds, which always feels like five seconds, uh, and then repeat. So uh, we'll rock and roll. Um, 
So yeah, participate if you can. If you can't, no big deal. So we're gonna hit start timer. Boom. And it's gonna give us a 10 second countdown. And then we're gonna rock and roll from there. It should beep to kind of give us a three second warning. There it is. Great, so we're doing 20 seconds of squats. Um, you can go as low as feels comfortable. If it helps, you can tap back to a chair. Uh, you can go slow control to really focus on your strength. You can go a little faster to get a little more cardio. So work in those squats. Rest. And then we've got 10 seconds of rest, which like I said, feels like five seconds. For the marching, if you need to hold on for balance, hold on for balance. So you're holding for five seconds, top foot as far away from bottom foot as possible, and switch. I'm gonna go on the timer as far away as possible. Switch. You could just be repping marching to get like cardio, switch. Um, but if you really work that isometric, that gives a good strength response. Um, so we got 10 seconds of rest again, already down to five seconds. We're going back to our squats. Squatting. Nice, when you're coming up from your squat, think about pushing your feet through the floor, squeezing your glutes. A lot of us like to use our back to come back up. Uh, you should also think about trying to keep your knees outside of your toes, trying not to let them dive in towards each other. Rest. There's that. And already, um, my watch has my heart rate at 124 right now, which I don't think it was that high prior. Uh, then we're going with a nice little march again, holding that for five seconds. You might lose your balance like I did. Switch. Holding as far as you can. You should really be squeezing the glute of the leg you're standing on. Switch. Great. Switch. Rest. And relax. You got 10 seconds of rest. So that is halfway through. Um, I think you're all going to get the point if we do one more round. So we'll do one more round through. Let's go. Great, so doing our squats again. If you need to modify with the hip hinge, you can modify with the hip hinge, or you could be raising up onto your toes. It is okay to let your knees go over your toes. I know that's crazy, but if you've ever gone downstairs, your knees go over your toes. Rest. Great, you got 10 more seconds of rest, and then we'll go there, and I think you'll have exhibit A when I come back and talk, and I'm like a little short of breath from three minutes of work. And march as far as you can, squeezing that glue to the leg you're standing on. Squeeze it harder than you have so far. Switch. And switch. Try to stand as tall as you can. Try not to lean back at all. Last one. And relax. Cool. And that is three minutes of our planned four minute workout. Um, and like I said, from that, like I can definitely feel uh, my heart rate is elevated a little bit and it just took three minutes. Um, so I'm down to 120 now, but um, that's good. My, I don't know, I think my presentation heart rate would probably be 80 beats per minute or something like that. Um, so that just gives you a really good example of how you can get really quick work in. And then you definitely wanna choose your client that you're working with, right? Um, depending on your relationship with your client, they would maybe be fair game for you to do that right at their bedside, right? Um, or, you know, depending on their state, you can leave the room on your 10 minute break and literally in three minutes, um, you can maybe get a little bit of a sweat going, right? Um, another option if you wanted to really ramp that up is you literally could have just done like, I'm gonna switch it every 30 seconds and you could have for two minutes straight just done squats for 30 seconds alternating march for 30 seconds, squat for 30 seconds, and like you can get a good workout in literally two to three minutes. Um, physiologically, all of you that participated, you now have more serotonin, more dopamine, more, nor, uh, more norepinephrine, uh, more, um, more endorphins flooding through your system right now. And uh, if I were to just list off a uh, common antidepressant medication is a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. It's literally trying to figure out how to get your body more serotonin. Um, uh, 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 our common pain killers are literally trying to block your body from reabsorbing dopamine. So they're like literally trying to get your body more dopamine. 
Um, so these are natural painkillers, uh, mood enhancers uh, for our mental health that are endogenous within our body and it's just a matter of getting them and you can get, uh, it kind of sounds funny, but instead of taking a smoke break, uh, you can take a exercise break to kind of get your hit, for lack of better words, of those things. Um, and then I will always throw the disclaimer that some of us based on our own body's anatomy and whatnot, exercise and all those other things, that's great. They're a nice compliment, but sometimes we still it's totally appropriate to need some medication help um, to come alongside and make it even better. Um, but if you can appreciate, usually medications, we can only take so much because they're side effects. Um, the side effect of exercise is time and sometimes some pain if we overdo it. But honestly, that's probably uncovering something where we would have gotten hurt doing some yard work or caring for someone in the first place. Uh, so then it's like, oh, I better get more mobile or strong. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's the, uh, um, that's that. And that's pretty much the summary. Um, I actually in, oh, wrong, that's in the time base. In the time base, I actually have that app I just used linked. Um, some other resources on our website, we do have our seven foundational movement patterns blog. Uh, so if you were looking into like, how can I get a full body workout? Uh, number one is just move, uh, get your heart rate up. And then there's six primary movement patterns uh, that you can train for well-rounded health. Um, and especially as a caregiver from the physical front, it's kind of the whole body, right? Like you need to use your legs to help lift and transfer. You gotta use your arm to reach and move lines and, uh, and care for them and dress them depending on their, their needs, right? Um, and so it's really full body, so we should be full body strong. So that seven foundational movement patterns helps simplify that. Uh, and it's full of exercise videos through our YouTube video and a chart actually that shows like them and kind of easiest to hardest. Uh, and then I did link our gardening and yard work tips and resources. And the reason being is that gardening and yard work tends to be a bunch of bending, lifting, reaching, standing. Um, and so, um, you know, it basically has a lot of the tips that you would need. Um, and then also on our website, the one thing I didn't talk about at all was flexibility, which is an important aspect. You could be the world's strongest person, but if you're tight, you can only move through so much range of motion. Um, so, uh, so mobility is important. Um, and uh, that blog kind of helps hit that as well. Um, so there's that, I was kind of, oh, so yeah, there's a playlist. I was a little distracted by the leaves. So there's leaves, there's how to properly perform yard work and gardening down low, which would kind of be your squatting and lifting, uh, working down low again, um, and then uh, up high, so that would kind of get your like reaching and everything. So uh, that's a resource on there as well. Um, and then, yeah, the last summary, we do have on our website uh, educational resources. Um, and so it has some pain resources, some pelvic health resources, uh, kind of our acronym for helping manage injuries, six pillars of health, how hard to push with exercise, seven foundational movement patterns, our YouTube playlists, our exercise video library on our website, which is just our YouTube on our website, and then the blog, which would take you straight to this too. Um, so that's on there as well. And then as well as we're always posting this kind of content on social media, um, so you can always follow us on any of our social media platforms as well. Um, uh, lastly, the thing to talk about too is you can apply these concepts to those you're working with. I, I recognize on the, uh, um, on the uh, hospice and palliative care side of things, right? Like we're definitely focusing more on comfort, right? Um, but if you can appreciate some of those things that I just listed, serotonin, dopamine, um, like all of that are usually medications that people towards end of life are getting, right? And so maybe it looks different. Maybe you do the AMRAP we just did, and if they, mobility-wise, are in their bed, um, maybe what they do is they do bridges where they're digging their feet in and they're lifting their hips up, right? And then for the march, they're just laying down and they're alternating doing a march while they're in bed, right? And so they could literally do the exercise with you and you're modifying. And then yes, you do wanna pay attention to energy conservation, right? So that Goldilocks, like you wanna make it so that it's depending on them. Sometimes it's just going through the motions. Sometimes a little challenging, right? Um, where maybe they actually get a little stronger where they've been atrophying, right? Could maybe be a little more functional for themselves. And again, they get those natural benefits of the cardiovascular and you get a two for it, you get the relationship 
uh, while you're at it. Um, and stress management because of those factors, right? So you can really be creative. Obviously, you're picking your, your patient or your client or your loved one that you would do that with. Um, but it can also be an encouraging thing where they literally have kind of a label that says like you're not going to get better, right? And they can have just these little things of getting better and be aware of, obviously they have a ton of factors that's affecting their sleep and their relationships and their faith, right? And their stress management and their nutrition, like if they have to, if they're relying on a G-tube, right? Like, um, so recognizing that and even educating on that and like kind of justifying like, of course you're feeling terrible. Like, look at all these six pillars of health that like you can't address well right now. Um, and so ultimately I talk about controlling the controllables. There are times where we cannot control the six pillars of health, but we usually can control some aspects of it. And so focus on what we control, try to get a little better every day. And that would apply to you putting your oxygen mask on. But then also I would hope that you have some strategies to also help put on the oxygen mask of the six pillars of health with those that you're working with as well. Any questions, comments, concerns? Mm. Choice. Intensity. Um, what I left out was that if you do 90 minutes of vigorous exercise, that is the equivalent of 150 minutes of moderate exercise. Um, and so vigorous would be good. What I will qualify on that is that obviously more intensity, you do increase risk for injury, right? Um, in general, if you're going slow and controlled, like I don't know that many of us on here are gonna be doing like box jumps, like jumping onto a box, right? So maybe on the intensity, you're adding some weight to your squats, right? Or you put a band around your feet or you did a step up for your march on the exercise we did. Those would all be ways to improve and increase intensity. Or even you added some speed. Um, like likely you're not gonna create any long-term serious injury um, with that workout that creates something you can't reverse, right? Could you break the straw on the camel's back and flare something up that was probably already underlying? Yeah, honestly, that was probably gonna happen anyways. <laughs> so we would never seek to create an injury, uh, but as long as you're being intentional, um, you're fine. But I would encourage you to, to apply that principle of a little more every day. You do want your body to be used to the loads. Um, so honestly, in my reasoning, that was another reason to cut it short at three minutes was like, I don't know, where people are at that, let's see it three minutes and kind of see how we respond. Because we've all had that where we feel great doing something and then the next day it's like, oh man. Uh, so the body responds to the loads placed upon it, so just a little bit more. But if, if you can choose vigor, that is, is ideal over duration. And then of course, you know, it's a both and, both are great. <laughs> Probably. Say you have a pulled arm muscle. Mm -hmm. What are some things you could do to keep it moving but not? Yeah. Um, so, so on our website, we have our blog that is called Rice No More. POP is the best acronym for healing and pain management. And so I don't know if people are familiar with the acronym RICE. Uh, it stands for Rest, Ice, Compress, Elevate. Um, the problem with that is that the doctor that actually founded that he was purely just focused on what can I do to reduce inflammation, right? Um, as he further studied it, he realized like our body doesn't send inflammation because it feels like it. Like that actually helps flush out the bad. It brings in your macrophages, your Pac-Man that bring out the bad tissue. It brings oxygen, all of that. So like inflammation, the right amount is actually good. Uh, so we really want to facilitate inflammation, not abolish inflammation. Um, and so rather than using ri rice, which literally it's like, well, when do I go from rest back to life, right? Um, it, we use the acronym POP. Uh, so the first P is protected. Uh, so if you strained your bicep, um, don't be doing a one rep max bicep curl, right? Um, don't do a ballistic handstand or vault maneuver or something crazy like that. Don't throw a baseball, right? Um, so that's protected. Uh, the O is optimally load. Um, and so what that means is try to be as active as you can. Um, don't like avoid pain per se. Uh, tolerate an acceptable level of pain where like, yeah, that hurts, but I think I'm okay. 
and that you don't think will be worse the next day. Um, so it would be okay to do like two pound bicep curls and like, ah, oh, it hurts a little bit, but like, I think I'll be fine tomorrow. Uh, and then do a little bit more. So if you took a few days off, do one set of 10, right? Prove to yourself, hey, that was cool. Okay, I'm gonna do two sets of 10. Hey, that was fine the next day. Okay, three sets of 10, right? And then, okay, I'm gonna ramp up to four pounds, right? And so you're adding a little bit more duration, a little bit more load intensity, and you're rebuilding it uh, over time. Um, and so um, that would kind of be it. The last P is pain management, uh, which is doing the first two things well, uh, to protect it, optimally load it. And then that would be ice or heat or a lotion or a tape or an over-the-counter med, or if you're a post-op, a prescription med. Um, but those are kind of our last resort options um, to facilitate it. Um, and so really I use those things when I can't otherwise control my pain and it's beyond that acceptable level, then I take those things. But I think culturally we try to take those things to abolish pain. And the problem is that makes it hard for us to load it right and get feedback. And so we tend to boom bust. We tend to boom with activity like, hey, I took my med, I feel great. And then you're still creating things and then as the med wears off, you already jumped up the inflammation. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, I must really need that medication, right? And so you take more. Uh, and there's more and more research showing that ibuprofen actually delays healing when you take it as prescribed for like a six week window. Um, so I still use it as a tool. It works better for me than Tylenol. Um, but really just when I'm like have pain at rest that I otherwise can't get rid of, that's when I rely on it as a tool. Um, so for the bicep, yeah, it's, it's applying that pop acronym. Yeah, that's that's challenging. To keep, you know, keep moving and, yeah. and uh, manage that. So we've thrown billions of dollars researching chronic back pain, and uh, I would love to think that it said, hey, if you see a PT that can crack your back, uh, give you some good manual therapy, and give you some targeted exercises that are what you need to feel better, that's the gold. That's not what the literature says. What the literature says is that if you exercise within that POP acronym, that's your best treatment. Um, and in conjunction with the other pain management things we talked about and you know my bias would be of course if something is uh, of course if something is tight like you should you could probably improve your flexibility and strength but ultimately it's that what I will say on that with a caregiver is there's a lot of bending over at bedside or whatever it may be um, honestly that's it's what I tell my throwing athletes sometimes like throwing is hard on your shoulder like Caregiving is hard on your back. Um, and so there's gonna be some times where it's gonna be sore. What I will say is societally, because back pain is so common, has a prevalence of 90% lifetime, so nine out of 10 people will get it, which I have no idea how 10% don't. Um, I've experienced back pain multiple times in my life. But um, like, just like you'd expect muscle soreness when you use like you know your calves for a hike, like you should expect probably some muscle soreness with that. Um, and so there's a difference between soreness and injury, right? So I like to say hurt versus harm. There's a difference between something kind of hurting versus that you harmed a tissue. And what's cool is that if you did hit the right amount, guess what? You actually got your back muscles and your glute muscles stronger. Uh, you're gonna recover from that. Uh, and then you're gonna come back stronger from it. Um, and so ultimately, if you can have some targeted exercises, so a combo of the stretches and the core strength to take stress off your back, but also some back and glute strengthening to have your back be able to tolerate more stress. I call that kind of burning the candle from both ends. That will set you up for success. What's hard is in order to get strength stronger, you have to challenge the fatigue and your job or caregiving for someone outside of your job is already taking it to fatigue. So it is a dance of strengthening it the right amount and still doing your caregiving and not overdoing it. So it, it does tend to be a slow um, progression, but I promise you if you started out with a hip hinge, if you did one thing, if you started out with a hip hinge and then you do two pounds and then five pounds and then 10 pounds and you just work on a deadlift pattern, which is just hinging at the hips, trying to stay neutral through the back, squeezing your glutes, coming back up. Um, I promise you two years down the road, like your back will be better with the exception of other life stuff that happens that makes it worse. Um, so it can be that simple, but you have to be patient and consistent. Uh, there's a term that the, uh, the oftentimes failure occurs not because we had the wrong plan, but we didn't stick with the right plan long enough. Um, and so 
that's something to consider for sure. And then certainly like see your PT and they'll assess how you're moving and um, go from there. I will say the physician recommendations right now is literally if someone sees you with back pain, tell them to be appropriately active. Like they basically tell you the POP acronym without using that acronym. And then if it's still hurting in six weeks, come back. <laughs> um, versus a PT will literally be like, here's all the things we can do. And if you have a red flag of, ooh, that might not be back pain, it might be organ referral or cancer or something like that, we recognize that and then refer you to your physician appropriately. So, yeah, good question. The other thing that can really fix that type any, any other questions? Cool, and then I see that Holly put the link to that on there. So my uh, that blog has all the things linked into it. So in that blog, there's the time-based workouts. If you click on that, it has the link to the smart wad timer that I saw someone else act, act about, so. Put it in here again, but. Uh, nice, and then I see someone asked, asked all of my acronyms, right? So yeah. Uh, that also is in the website, but AMRAP as many rounds as possible, EMOM every minute on the minute, AQAP as quickly as possible, Tabata, I don't know if it's an acronym or not, but it's basically for that uh, kind of rest, work, rest ratio. So, um, and then I'm not familiar with slow wave sleep, so I don't know the details of that. That's why I want a sleep expert to better write our blog. But there's so much good information out there about sleep now. Um, uh, there is, if anyone wants to go in the weeds with any of this, there is a podcast called the Huberman Lab Podcast, um, and it goes into significant detail about sleep and nutrition, like kind of the four pillars of health, pretty much. Um, I haven't seen any podcasts, but they're like two hour long podcasts, but it is like, you know, if I maybe think about the stereotypical person living in Corvallis, I think you would love the podcast. <laughs> um, so it is the Huberman Lab Podcast. Yeah, and I'll, I will probably add his podcast at some point to my Six Pillars of Health blog, too, as a reference, because now that I think about it, it's a good getting into the weeds reference.